Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It is Canada Day weekend, and we're really thankful that God's given us a safe place where we can live, a prosperous place where we can enjoy His bounty, and a place where we have freedom to gather like this for our worship service. Today is a day of celebration. Four people are going to publicly profess their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior this morning. And two of them are getting baptized. And if that wasn't enough, we get to come to God's open house of mercy and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. If you're a guest among us, a warm welcome to you. If you generally participate in the Lord's Supper in your home church, you're welcome to come and celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. I'll give instructions on exactly how that's going to work uh, when we get to that part of the service. For now, welcome. My name's Harold Winter, and I'm the pastor here at Cross Point, and we're delighted that you're here to worship our God and Savior with us today. Please rise. We're going to begin with singing 10,000 Reasons. Praise the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary, praise Him in His mighty heavens, praise Him for His acts of power, praise Him for His surpassing greatness, praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise Him with a harp and lyre, praise Him with timbrel and dancing, praise Him with the strings and pipe, praise Him with a clash of cymbals, praise Him with resounding cymbals, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God calls us to this time of worship so that we can sing His praises, tell about the amazing things that He has done for us and for all creation. God greets you to this time of worship saying grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Together we say, Amen. Please join me in prayer.
Heavenly Father, we're really thankful that you've called us here in this auditorium for this time of worship. We're thankful for the things that you have done in your creation, the marvelous ways, the way that you put things together, the way that you stepped back and looked over creation, including humankind, and said, wow, that's very good. We share that awe and are impressed at your handiwork. We're really thankful for your call on our lives. We're thankful that when humankind messed up, disobeyed you, ran away from you, that you chased us down and brought us back into your family. And we're delighted that we get to celebrate that this morning. We're thankful along with Irene and Cindy and Joe and Sam as we can celebrate your promises to them and can rejoice as they profess their faith publicly that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. We pray that that can give joy to many of us and that our celebration of baptism and the Lord's Supper can strengthen the faith of each one that's here, each one that's watching online, each one that watches throughout the week on TV, so that we can be your dearly loved people and bask in your love and your care for us. Hear our prayer. In Jesus we come. Amen. We're going to sing Seeking the Lost. Actually, no, we're not. You may be seated. This is actually a video. You can sing if you'd like, yeah. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanders on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar, going afar, on the mountain, upon the mountain, bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again, into the fold, into the fold of my redeemer, of my redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going afar, going afar, upon the mountain, upon the mountain bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again. Into the fold, into the fold of my redeemer, of my redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen. Pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Going afar, going afar, upon the mountain, upon the mountain. Bringing the one, bringing the wonder back again, back again. Into the fold, into the fold of my Redeemer, of my Redeemer. Jesus the Lamb, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. I should have introduced that better. When we were planning this worship service, we asked each of the people who's professing their faith if there was a song or two that helped them in their journey of faith. And so Sam looked through the uh, songs that he listens to, and this was the very top of his uh, listen to, and one that was important in his journey of faith. So thank you, Sam, for including that in our service. We've come to the point where we get to be reminded of what baptism means and how we respond with faith. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrament of baptism reminds and assures us that we share in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we are incorporated in Christ's holy church. Baptism proclaims the faith of the church. The water of baptism is a sign and a seal of God's promise to cleanse us from sin to renew us, and to reconcile all things 
to himself in Jesus Christ. In baptism, God's people are promised the gift of the Holy Spirit as a pledge of this reconciliation. The same Holy Spirit binds us to each other and joins us to Christ's ministry of love and of peace and of justice. And so here are these words from Holy Scripture. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were, therefore, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So baptism is the sign and seal of God's promise to, this covenant, to his covenant people. In baptism, God promises by grace alone to forgive our sins, to adopt us into the body of Christ, the church, and to send the Holy Spirit daily to renew us and cleanse us and to raise us to eternal life. This promise of baptism is made visible in water. Water cleanses, water purifies, it refreshes, water sustains. And you know what? Jesus Christ is the living water. So through baptism, Christ calls us to a life of new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world, and to live a new life, a holy life. Yet, when we fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy, nor should we just continue on sinning. For baptism is a sign and a seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. And so I invite Irene and Cindy and Joe and Sam to come forward to respond to these questions to the baptism that they've had before the baptism they're about to receive. Come on forward, please. Yeah, come stand over here by the baptismal font. Hey, you go sit down by Joe. I was kidding. Yeah? So we now ask you to stand before God and before his people to answer the following questions as a public profession of your faith. When I have all four questions, I'll ask you individually for your response. You can respond with, I do, God help me, if that's the way you'd like to. First, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And he was sent to redeem the world. Do you love him and trust him as the one who saves you from sin? And do you, with repentance and joy, embrace Jesus as the Lord of your life? And do you believe that the Bible is the word of God revealing Christ and his redemption? And that the confessions of this church faithfully reflect this revelation? And do you accept the gracious promises of God extended to you in your baptism? And do you affirm your union with Christ and with his church, which your baptism signifies? And finally, do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church in a spirit of Christian love and participate in its worship, in its fellowship, and in its mission? Cindy Marie Giro, how do you respond? I do. With God's help? With God's help. Very good. Joseph John Giro, how do you respond? Samuel William Hoover, how do you respond? I do, God helping me. And Irene Frederica Braun, how do you respond? I do, with God's help. I invite all of you to stand with us so that we can profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It'll be on the screen. So that the words of the Church of God of all time and all places we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Sam also prepared a few words that he would like to use to express his faith and do it a little more personally. There's a mic there. Shall I grab it for you? Yeah, sure. yeah good. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, so I wanted to say a little something. I heard about God at an early age growing up in church. I was told that I was a sinner and God would punish me for eternity unless I repented of my sins and accepted Jesus as my Savior through faith in him and his crucifixion, death, and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. I believed as fast as I could, but I quickly got distracted by school and other things because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't follow all the rules. Then I learned that true repentance is giving up doing what I want and doing what God wants instead. Like many people I knew that, <clears throat> like many people, I knew that God loves me and his grace is something I don't deserve, but I wasn't able to truly experience Jesus in my life until I heard that God's grace is God laboring on my behalf and <clears throat> that he sent the Holy Spirit to live in me when I had true faith in Jesus and invited him into my life. Now I understand Jesus has freed me from sin, death, and the, this world by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful to God for working in my life, answering my prayers, and giving me assurance of my salvation. The Holy Spirit gave me new life in Jesus at my conversion. Now I experience this new life in Jesus by reading my Bible, praying, and being spiritually minded to receive instruction and power from God to do what He wants. I live this new life He has given to me for His glory to be known and his name to be praised while I continue to live by the Spirit like at the beginning of my conversion. I trust and obey Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I follow him through this baptism, and I wait for his return as he renews me more like himself every day, and as I confidently expect his righteousness to cover my sins as he receives me into his kingdom. Please join me in prayer. We give you thanks, O holy and gracious God, for the gift of water. How in the beginning of creation your spirit moved over the waters. How the waters of, in the waters of the flood you destroyed evil. You led the people of Israel through the sea into the freedom of the promised land. And in the river Jordan, John baptized our Lord and your spirit anointed him. By his death and by his resurrection, Jesus Christ, the living water, forgives us, frees us from sin and death, and opens the way to life everlasting. And so we thank you, O God, for the gift of baptism. How in this water you confirm to us that we are buried with Christ in his death, and we are raised to share in his resurrection. How we are being renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and are united to Christ and his church in mission. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray upon those baptized here today and those professing faith, that this water, the reminder of baptism, may be a gushing spring for eternal life. Wash away their sin, raise them to a new life, and graft them into the body of Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on them, we pray, that they may have wisdom to discern their gifts, strength to obey your will, and joy in answering your call. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be all praise, all honor, and all glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And so, Joe, come on forward. Joseph, John, Jero, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can step back if you like. And Sam, come on forward. Samuel William Hoover, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to ask you to rise once more, please. For I have a question for you. 
Dearly loved people of God, do you promise to love and support these new members with your prayers, with your encouragement, with your example? And do you promise to receive them as members of God's family in love, to pray for them, to help instruct them in the faith, to encourage them and sustain them in the fellowship of believers, people loved by God, how do you respond? We do, God helping us. You may be seated again. I'm going to reach behind you here. Thank you. Joe, it's been a delight to get to know you a little bit better in the last half year or so. And uh, there's a certificate here of your baptism, and there's a book here. I know you're not always that much of a reader, but this is a book that day by day helps work through the Lord's Prayer and helps you strengthen your faith. God's blessing. And Cindy, I have a certificate for you as well of your profession of faith. And another book. This is Philip Yancey's What's So Amazing About Grace. I hope it helps you as you delve into the grace that God's lavished on you. Thank you very much. Yeah, God's blessing. Sam, I know you are a reader, and you like to study this kind of stuff. And so I have Timothy Keller's Jesus the King. It's been a delight to get to know you. I love how you're studying. Keep it up, man. There's lots more to explore, lots more gifts for you to explore of your own, and ways to use those in the kingdom of God. God's blessing. Of the four, Irene, I think I've known you the longest. And I really appreciate how you take care of your family, how you invest in the life of this church. It's been a joy and delight to get to know you. I have another copy of Why Pray, going into the Lord's Prayer to help you in your journey of faith. God's blessing to you. You can talk, absolutely. I didn't know you were prepared to talk. I'll hold that. You hold that. We're good. Thank you, Pastor Harold. And thank you for inviting me to the new members' meetings. I enjoyed our meetings with Cindy, Joe, and Sam. My name is Irene Braun. I am Tammy Christmas's mother and the great-grandmother, better known as Gigi, to Tammy's grandson, Young Braxton. A few years ago, Tammy became a member of Cross Point, and Braxton was baptized by Pastor Harold. I remember Pastor Harold carrying him around the sanctuary for everyone to greet him and welcome him as a child of God. I remember his smile, and it was beautiful to see. Yeah, go ahead, just put that down, that's good. I am grateful for all the help and love that everyone has given to Tammy and Braxton. It will take me a little while to get to know everybody by name. I have always been a Christian, and I have had my share of life experiences. At times I wondered how I would, or if I could, cope with all the changes that I have had to navigate. Like most mothers, I was busy working and raising my children. I can say that it was not always easy. But I do know it was the most important job that I have had. I think I can say that I was running on autopilot. (laughs) Time goes by and my children and grandchildren are adults now. I am a little wiser now and my faith is stronger. And I know I was not alone during the difficult times throughout my life. The Holy Spirit was within me to guide me. And God was gracious unto me and gave me the strength that I needed during the difficult times. Change is the law of life, and I am sure that there will be more life experiences to come. I know that as I live my life as a mother 
and grandmother and a Gigi, the worries will be there for myself and my family. But it is my prayer that my worries will be less now. I have asked Jesus to help me, and I can say that I am feeling better and my heart is not so heavy. It is a wonderful feeling to know that I will not be alone. Also, since I've been attending Crosspoint and listening to Pastor Harold's sermons, I have taken his words to heart. Even at my age, I know that there is so much more to learn. The new member meetings were just a start. Thank you, Pastor Harold. I believe that there are angels among us to guide us. My angel is my Braxton. He has brought so much joy. I love him when he laughs. I love him when he is sad. And I love him when he is naughty. Braxton is now a three-nager and has graduated to Sunday school. I am seeing the world through his curious and innocent eyes. To my family I say, God gives us our gifts and it is what we do with the gifts that is our gift to God. Most sincerely, I thank everyone for welcoming me as a new member and part of the body of Christ. The end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well said. Thank you. You can be seated now. You can go find your seats. Yeah. There's another video now, and it's the song that uh, Irene just referenced, Angels Among Us. It's a song that she selected as important in her journey of faith. I was walking home from school on a cold winter's day. Took a shortcut through the woods And I lost my way It was getting late And I was scared and all alone But then a kind old man Took my hand and led me home Mama couldn't see him Oh, but he was standing there And I knew in my heart was the answer to my prayers. Oh, I believe there are angels among us, sent down to us from somewhere up above. They come to you and me in our darkest hour. Show us how to us how to give, to guide us with the light of love. When life failed troubled times and had me down on my knees, there's always been someone to come along and comfort me. Word from a stranger to lend a helping hand, a phone call from a friend just to say I understand. But ain't it kind of funny at the dark end of the road? Someone lights the way just to see. From somewhere up above, they come to you and me 
Grace us with their mercy in our time of need. Oh, I believe there are angels among us sent down to us from somewhere. To guide us with the light of love. Thanks, Irene, for that selection. We get to worship God in all areas of our life, and part of this whole um, profession of faith is our dedication to, to serving God in all of our life. One of the ways that we get to do that is by giving back to God and, and to His church some of what He's blessed us with. And if that is interesting to you, that's a theme we're going to be following all this week in the daily readings. There's copies on the table there, or you can sign up to receive that by email. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking an awful lot more about worshiping God through our gifts and through financial means as well. Today, the offerings are for Crosspoint. There's a box in the hall there that you can give on your way out if you'd like to do that, or the diaconate. It's a fancy word for talking about our deacons and the way that they are generous in helping people inside our congregation who have need, as well as people outside our congregation who have need. And uh, from some of the things that I hear from them, they have been busy with uh, connecting with people in the community and have op had opportunities to be representatives for you and for the kingdom of God and being generous to help people in their needs. Thank you for your generosity as well and for giving the deacons what they need so that they can be generous on behalf of the church. In terms of announcements, I'd like to mention that uh, you'll have a chance to congratulate those who just profess their faith after the service they'll be here at the front and you can come past and, and offer their encouragement we're also going to have a hot dog roast here immediately after the worship service so you can enjoy some time together and some food together but that's not all this evening what is it six o'clock six thirty six o'clock uh john and charlene sitting here you can ask them about it afterwards invite all of you to bring your lawn chairs and come to a bonfire at their place They'll give you directions and all that kind of stuff. You don't know quite where that is yet. Come on down. It's usually a really enjoyable time, always a, an enjoyable time, uh, hanging out there around the bonfire. Am I missing anything? Then let's go to God in prayer. And to begin that, is there anything that you have seen this week that made you say, wow, is God ever amazing? Ken. Driving to work. Yep. I was amazed at how birds were perched on the top of the wheat and just making that thing. The wheat supporting the birds. Yeah. And God being the pilot. Yeah. So these birds that can land on the top of a stalk of wheat and just peck away and, and grab some of those kernels and can eat that, for when you catch a glimpse of that, and you marvel at the way their claws hang on and the way that food is there, it does take your breath away. Heavenly Father, we are immensely thankful and just in awe at your creation that you made wheat stalks strong enough to bear the weight of a bird. And birds, for their claws to be able to hang on to that and be able to find food that way. You're the one that feeds the sparrow. And we are so thankful because we recognize that if, if you care for birds that are a dime a dozen, that you care so much more for people that are made in your image, and that at the cost of Jesus' death and resurrection, you have been rescued and redeemed from death and from punishment. And so thank you, Heavenly Father, for your deep, deep love for your creation, for your intricate, in the fancy way that you made stuff, and just your amazing goodness in your creation. Hear our prayer in Jesus. 
Anything else that you've seen this week that made you say, go, wow, wow, there's a few others. Alette, I saw your hand first. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Yeah. So this is an answer to prayer. Alette's brother Peter got diagnosed with a brain tumor. And it's kind of scary because her mom recently died from cancer as well. And so it just sends a whole bunch of reverberations through. We've been praying for her the last little while, or for him for the last little while. He had his surgery this week. And uh, some of the, they have to give you that whole list of all the things that could go wrong. And uh, we rejoice with Alette that not all of them went wrong and that he's as well as he is. Heavenly Father, your work in Peter's life is, well, it takes our breath away. We're thankful for the knowledge of the doctors and the way they could apply that in his situation. We're thankful that all those worst case scenarios didn't take place. And we recognize that, well, healing is still going to take a miracle. And so we lift him up before you again, knowing that whether he acknowledges you or not, that you love him and that you are concerned for his well-being. And so along with Alette and his, her family, we pray that, that Peter can enjoy your care and he can come to faith in you as healer and Lord. In Jesus we pray. Amen. What do you see, Rose? Yeah. The way that his thanks move, it's very cool. Yeah. Snails are, are actually born with their shells. Snails are born with their shells. That's really cool. So a couple weeks ago, I mentioned something about a poisonous snake in a sermon, and I got corrected that po- uh, snakes are venomous, not poisonous. And that's because Rose has a real interest in snakes and in all kinds of, yeah. Well, yes. Right. Because it eats those poisons out of the frogs. Yep. It keeps the poison inside the frogs. Yeah. Heavenly Father, the way that you made your creation continues to amaze us. Only one kind of poisonous snake, and only poisonous because it eats dart frogs. Wow. We're thankful for the way that you made stuff. We're thankful for the opportunity to study this kind of stuff, to look it up, to read, it up, read about it, to watch videos about it. And we pray that all of the science that we do, all the exploring that we do, all of the studying that we do uh, helps us praise you better and just respond, glorifying your name for what you've done and the marvelous way you've put stuff together in this world. We praise you and glorify you because people, too, are wonderfully made. We know that full well. Amen. Yeah, Phil. Yeah. Like multiple, but uh, the two that really pop are I have a couple of clients. One is being accepted to Team Challenge, and Good. he is uh, I'm about to embark on a really amazing new journey. And another client who has uh, been on this journey for a while um, is actually going to, I mentioned to him, perhaps he should volunteer there, and we've actually given him a position there. Cool. Yeah. You know, uh, reciprocal kind of relationship that uh, is so fulfilling. Yeah. So Phil works with people that are at risk for abusing young people, I think mainly. No, uh, all. Oh, the whole spectrum, everybody. And uh, he gets an opportunity to have one on one conversations with people about stuff that really, really matters. And he's rejoicing that one person in, in the conversation um, accepted the invitation to uh, participate in Teen Challenge which is a great ministry that uh, allows people to uh, kick their addictions in the power that God gives them through the Holy Spirit. And so, yeah, thanks for the work that you do. That, that's tough stuff. You see some tough stuff, but you see some really amazing people. And uh, thank you for your work. Heavenly Father, we keep praising you for the way that you made things. And, and you made people complicated. And yet, yeah, really, really neat. We're delighted and thankful for the way that each individual 
bears your image, reflects some facet of your identity, your character, your goodness, and uh, it, it takes our breath away to see that. We regret and lament how some people, all of us, I guess, are, are stained by sin and broken and not functioning exactly the way that we ought to. And we're so delighted that in Jesus Christ that it's possible to be renewed, to be made whole, to be forgiven, to be restored to the glory that we had originally. And we pray that that happens in this client's life. And we're thankful for Phil's role in being able to help people in that process. Heavenly Father, we recognize that, that that's a need that each of us has, that there's challenges and troubles in our households, in our extended families, among our friends, and just playing in our community here in Tilsonburg. And we pray with thanks that there's hope. And we pray that these resources can be accessed and that people can kick addictions and can rely completely on your Holy Spirit for strength and for joy. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that if there's a part for us as Cross Point Community Church or members of it to, to be part of that, we pray that you use us, that you direct us, that you put us in the right spot at the right time so that we can be used by you for your glory, for your kingdom, and to help people that otherwise, well, otherwise just wouldn't connect with you. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Anything else that we should talk to God about? Yeah, Danielle. Yep. And um, right now, five of the seven are all blooming. That's so cool. Glorious. And the one rose we named as Virginia's rose. Cool. Um, his dad had called it that. It's a beautiful yellow rose. She is now about three feet tall and is starting to have her first bud. That's really cool. Yeah. So these uh, rose plants are important not just because they're beautiful rose plants but because they're Phil's dad's rose plants that he planted and now they've transplanted and uh, it doesn't always work really well for roses when they get transplanted for them to, to bud and yet for the last couple of weeks I keep getting these photos sent to me <laughs> of beautiful roses and uh, we're happy with you Danielle and uh, God's grace that transplanting works that well and uh, these reminders of, of dad and, and, and also Virginia it's, it's really cool Heavenly Father we're really thankful Transplanted roses, blooming, doesn't always happen. And yet in this case it did, and for that we give you thanks. We remember with sadness the people that were important to us that have passed away. And we're thankful that this is a safe place to, to talk about our losses, to talk about our sadness. And we're thankful that in Jesus Christ you are restoring and renewing all things. And, and so we're not worried about Phil's dad or or Phil's sister, Virginia, because they're in your hands, they're in your company, they're in a safe spot. But we pray that as we grieve losses that we've had recently, or even losses that loom over us from a long time ago, we're thankful that we can bring that to you, and that you give comfort, you give reassurance, and you transplant us into a place that's safe as well. We're looking forward, Heavenly Father, to the new creation, so the day when we see you face to face, the day when you wipe every tear away from our eyes, may that day come soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. The kids are going to come forward, and then we're going to sing that all together.
Acts chapter 8, we're going to begin reading at verse 26. This is after, uh, well, quite a while after Jesus' death, after his resurrection, after Jesus ascended to glory. This is after Pentecost, since the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church, and people have been able to share the gospel and others to respond in faith. The church is just growing and not just in Jerusalem, it started to grow further and farther and further to uh, Samaria and eventually to the ends of the earth. And this story is part of the, the, the account we're about to read is part of the story of how the gospel reaches to the ends of the earth. Starting at verse 26 in Acts t- chapter 8. Now, the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, like the Ethiopians so long ago, we we find Scripture sometimes difficult to understand. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you help explain it to us. Use the words of the preacher so that what you have to say to your church becomes clear. And and give us attentiveness. Give us ears to hear and minds to understand what you have to say to your church this morning. Meet with us. Tune our ears and our hearts to your word so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When one person professes faith in Jesus Christ, it's a really exciting day. We're told that the angels in heaven rejoice when people profess faith in Jesus Christ. And here this morning, four people publicly stood here and profess their faith before you and before God. I mean, imagine the celebration going on right now in heaven. I mean, that's why we had to have balloons up here, because there's just reason to celebrate what God has done. And so I'm really thankful with Irene and Cindy and Joe and Sam that they were able to profess their faith, that God brought them to that place, 
that they could publicly profess their faith this morning. And I'm thankful that they felt welcome here at Crosspoint. Each one of them said when we sat down with the elders and they talked about their journey of faith, they said it, it was really cool how warmly we were welcomed here at Crosspoint. It's exciting to see people here at Crosspoint step out of the comfort zone. People who say, you know what, I, I don't really like talking to strangers, but here I am anyhow. Hi, my name's Harold, and I'm glad you're here. Right? Some, some of us don't always feel wired that way or that it's easy to do. it, And yet you've been doing that. And that's really exciting that God's making Crosspoint that kind of a welcoming place. And yet for all the great things that are happening here at Crosspoint, I don't want anybody here or on the, the video to think that, that Crosspoint deserves all the credit for what God's doing among us. No, all the credit, all the glory... And all the thanks needs to go to God for what he's doing here among us at Cross Point Community Church. I think that's one of the points of contact between our experience here this morning and the passage that we just read from Acts chapter 9, or 8 rather. See, the author of Acts, Luke, the same one that wrote the, the gospel according to Luke, the author of Acts shows that God set up this meeting. God set up this meeting between Philip and the Ethiopian official. It's right there in verse 26, right? Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so you can see a green dotted line there, kind of, if you really look closely, going from Jerusalem headed towards Gaza. And that's where this divine appointment took place. And then Philip was there walking along that road, and he wouldn't have been there on time to, to meet this chariot without the prompting of God. But then once... Philip was in place, and he saw this chariot coming, holding this high official. Then the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And I don't know how many scowling guards were there, guarding the treasure of the treasure of the Kandake of Ethiopia. But Philip, in obedience to God's instructions, in obedience to the Holy Spirit, kept pace alongside the chariot. In my line of work, we call these kind of things divine appointments. Wouldn't you say, Jack? Divine appointments. It's a connection with something or a connection with somebody you just didn't plan. It's that email that you got out of the blue, just didn't expect. It's the unplanned visitor who drops by. It's when you feel compelled to go talk to that person sitting in their car in the parking lot on the side of the road and just say, hey, how you doing? The way that Luke tells the story of Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian official. It's obvious that this is a divine appointment. God made all the arrangements for this conversation to take place. But who's Philip? This is not Philip the Apostle. So Philip the Apostle, one of the twelve who followed Jesus, it's not him. This is a different Philip. We first met Philip in Acts chapter 6. We talked about that passage a few weeks ago. So Philip is one of the seven who were chosen to distribute food when some of the widows in the community were getting left out in the daily distribution of food. And it was particularly a problem because the Hebrews were, Hebrew widows were getting taken care of well, but the Greek widows were not getting taken care of well. And so Philip was one of those people who had a Greek name, named after Philip of Macedon, so a Greek name who were responsible for taking care of Hebrew widows and Greek widows, making sure that the food got distributed fairly. He's one of those seven. But he's not just one of those, we call them deacons now, who do that kind of work. He's also called Philip the Evangelist. Because if you were to start at the beginning of chapter 8, you would have read how God's Word describes Philip's journey to Samaria. When he went north to Samaria from Jerusalem, he started telling everybody there, the Samaritans who were there, that the, Jesus is the Messiah. And so many people responded with faith to his proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah, that the church in Jerusalem sent reinforcements. Peter, you better go. John, you better go. We need to send out our A team because amazing stuff is happening up north in Samaria, and we need you to be there on the ground to help Philip preach and teach and baptize people so the Holy Spirit can do and continue to do its work among the people in Samaria. And this is not the last time we hear about Philip the Evangelist. 
Later on, Philip continues on to Caesarea, this passage tells us. And we next see him there as well, many years later, when Luke and Paul are on their journey back, bringing the, the gifts from people in Greece to help the Christians who are in Jerusalem. And they stop by in Caesarea. And Philip says, you've got to stay at my place. And Luke makes a comment that he met Philip and his four daughters. And Philip's four daughters were all prophets who prophesied in the name of the Lord. That's the kind of stuff we talked about last week. We had a baptism of a child last week, and we talked at length about how you raise up children in faith. And it seems like Philip the Evangelist was able to do that in his household. His four daughters were raised so that they could prophesy, talk about God's word in ways that were powerful, in ways that brought people to faith. Again, God's grace at work in Philip and in his household. And so here in Acts chapter 8, at the end of the passage, at the end of the chapter, God made arrangements for Philip to explain the gospel to this Ethiopian official. It's kind of cool, though. He's not starting from scratch. He doesn't have to start at the very beginning. God's already been working in the life of this Ethiopian official the, the fancy technical theological term for that is prevenient grace, grace that went before. And so this Ethiopian official, some point in his life, came to faith in God, became a worshiper of the Lord. And so it was so important, his faith was so important to him, that he traveled from Ethiopia all the way up to Jerusalem so that he could go to the temple and worship God in person there. Now, as the crow flies, that's 2,500 some odd kilometers. I don't think he went the way the crow flies. The way that Google Map would send you now if you went walking, it takes about 4,000 some odd kilometers to get there, 926 hours. He went by chariot. Maybe it was faster. But he takes his faith pretty seriously if he's going to make that kind of a trip, invest that kind of time and money in worshiping God in the ten temple. And now he's on his way home when God makes this divine appointment between him and Philip. But he didn't come home empty-handed. On his lap, he has this scroll of Isaiah the prophet. I wonder if this is only one of the things that he picked up when he was in Jerusalem. I wonder if he was browsing through the bookstores and souvenir shops and said, you know what, I think I'll take home this scroll of Isaiah the prophet. A perfect souvenir, right? And yet as he's working his way through this scroll, he's struggling to understand what he's reading. It kind of makes sense. The Old Testament books of prophecy are often difficult to understand. And yet he's been working on this hard. He's gone all the way through the scroll and is actually at what we now call chapter 53. He's been working at this for a while. And it's an awesome chapter. Now, you want homework? Let me give you homework. If you were in Philip's sandals, and you had the opportunity to explain the gospel to somebody from this passage, how would you do it? This is the passage of Scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, he did, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his, his life was taken from the earth. So at home, this afternoon, tomorrow morning, pull somebody aside and say, hey, you know what? Let's try this. I'm going to try and explain the gospel from this Bible passage. It's your homework. This is how I do it. The author of the book of Isaiah, is not talking about himself. He is talking about someone else. The author is talking about the long-promised Messiah, the one that God told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he is coming, the one that God told Adam and Eve, he will crush the serpent's head. That one, that Messiah is the one that Isaiah the prophet is talking about. And he is the one who was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And why was he led to the slaughter? Well, just like the Passover lamb 
was slaughtered so that God's punishment, God's punishment on Pharaoh and all the Egyptians passed over all the houses of the Israelites who were eating the Passover lamb. That lamb's blood was shed so that God's angel of death would pass over their household. And yet all of the Egyptian households were punished for their disobedience against God. In the same way, Jesus the Messiah is the Passover lamb. He was led to the slaughter so that the punishment for sin passes over everybody who puts their faith, their hope, their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This is a gift. Yeah, Jesus was deprived of justice. If he had received justice, then the Sanhedrin would have sent him home and said, go away, you're you're innocent. And Pilate would have said, you're innocent. I find nothing wrong with this man. I'm going to release him instead of flog him and have him crucified. But no, he was crucified unjustly. Although he's 100% obedient to his Father in heaven, Jesus did not protest when he was tried. He did not protest when he was executed. He did not open his mouth. His life was taken to rescue the creation that God loves. I mean, if you were to to scroll down a little further in Isaiah chapter 53, you'd find these verses. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered among the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. This is the good news that we celebrate here this morning. I mean, already as a kid, I realized I didn't live up to God's standard. Already as a kid, I realized that I just could not be good enough. And some of the people who profess their faith said that as well this morning. You can determine your success at being obedient to God for yourself. I know where I stand. And if I stood before God as judge of all creation, and he opened up the books and he judged me on what I've done, I would deserve punishment. And the punishment for sin is always and only death. An eternity cut off from God and all his grace and all his mercy. And that's why Jesus' death, like a lamb slent to the slaughter, is really, really good news. As a person who was 100% obedient to his heavenly Father, as a person who is 100% God as well, Jesus is the perfect substitute to make intercession for transgressors. At the cross, God put all the punishment for human sin on Jesus so that he died in our place. So that we, you, can be clothed in the holiness, the obedience, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when you come before God for judgment, he will say, I, Jesus, have paid the price for that person already. So that you get to enjoy life. Life with God. Life with Jesus Christ. Life eternally in the good creation that is being renewed in Jesus' resurrection. What would stop you from enjoying this offer? What stops you from putting your faith, professing your faith publicly, that Jesus Christ is Lord? What stops you from living out that faith in each day, in the way that you act, the way that you talk, in the things you imagine, dream about, and are ambitious about? You see... Life with faith in Jesus Christ makes all of life this new experience. So that instead of trying to impress God and other people with our goodness, acting good is no longer a burden. We've been rescued from sin and death. Why would we go down that path any longer? No, instead, we're free in Jesus Christ to live a life of loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, live a life of loving our neighbor as ourselves because that's the kind of life that Jesus lived and we want to be like our big brother Jesus when we grow up. That's our goal, that's our ambition in our behavior, in our attitude, in the words that we use. And so God uses our faith, uses our renewed attitude so that we can do good in our households, that we can do good in our community. And God uses our obedience to his commands and instructions so other people can hear about his love for the world. I mean, that's at the heart of our faith, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the good news. 
that we celebrate, that we're reminded and assured of all over again every time we stand around the baptismal font. This sacrament is not just for the person getting wet. This sacrament is for each of us to remember what Christ has done. The same thing with the Lord's Supper table. Each time we take the bread, each time we take the cup, we remember and we believe that Christ's body was broken for us, his blood was shed for us to cover over all of our sin, all of our guilt, so that the judgment of God passes over us and we're set free. And so it's a big deal to come to the Lord's Supper table. Don't come if that's not your profession of faith. But if it is, even just a little bit of faith in Jesus Christ, come, welcome, enjoy and celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for you and for your salvation and for the renewal and setting straight of the whole world. And to seize those moments when you have a divine appointment from God, when the Lord sets it up for you to share your faith with somebody else. If you have your eyes open, you will see opportunities to see how that takes place. And it's not always with the loudest or most outspoken person that this happens. For three of the people that did public profession of faith today, Emery Jiro was really important in their journey of faith. Emery Jiro was a long-term member in our congregation, but he hasn't been able to attend worship services before his death in January for at least four years. He wasn't here after our renovation. He wasn't here after COVID. He wanted to be, but he wasn't. But when he did attend worship services, he used to stand there at the back corner and welcome everybody as they came in. He'd hand out a bulletin each one and just be delighted to see each person as they came in. And so it was tough to see him close to the end when cancer was eating him away and he was just a scrap of what he used to be and his voice was much more feeble and he wasn't able to do the things that he wanted to do or go the places he wanted to go. But God still used him. It's amazing the way that God used him. He wrestled with that, of course, at the end. Why do I have to keep on going? And why is it taking so long for God to call me home? He really wanted to see his wife Nancy again. He really wanted to see his Lord and Savior face to face. But God said, wait, I've still got stuff for you to do. And so when he was on his deathbed in the hospital here in Tilsonburg, you, Joe, and Cindy made a promise to him. And said to your brother, brother in law, we're going to start going to Cross Point Community Church. And they have done that. It's been a huge blessing for you, it's been a blessing for us. And they're not the only ones. Sam Hoover also got to know Emery when he was sick. Sam delivered as one of his jobs for, the God, for Godfather's Pizza. And he would bring pizza. He'd bring other things. Eventually, you did all sorts of shopping for him, didn't you? Thanks for doing that. You even did some personal care for him over the, over the time you got to know him. And part of that, I think, helped spark your faith and your journey. At least it did point you in the direction of Cross Point Community Church, and we're really grateful for that as well. So Emery Jiro, particularly in the last couple of months of his life, would not strike you as this amazing evangelist. He couldn't move from his chair for the last weeks of his life. And yet God used him to help people in their journey of faith. And if God can use Emery Jiro for that, God can use each one of us. Are, are you ready for those kind of divine appointments? Are you prepared to listen when the Holy Spirit prompts you and said, hey, you know what? I got a trip planned for you. You're going to take this trip from Jerusalem all the way down to Gaza, and you're going to have to try and catch up to this chariot, and you have to try and explain from Isaiah 53 of all places, this gospel of Jesus Christ to this Ethiopian who probably doesn't speak your language right away. But don't fear. Because if God helped Philip do that, if God helped Emery do that, God the Holy Spirit can use you and your testimony and your understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ to help people in their journey of faith as well. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we are immensely thankful for what you have done for us and for our salvation. We're thankful for the way you redeem and rescue your world, your creation. And it's really neat to to have a front row seat as people respond to the gospel with faith. We're thankful for your faithful servant, Emery Jiro, and for the way that he could testify to what he believed. As he was sick and had a, a small sphere of influence, you still used him mightily. And for that, we praise and glorify you. We're thankful that you use us here at Crosspoint to welcome people, to proclaim the gospel, to sing songs of faith, to be generous and hospitable in your name and for your glory. And we're thankful for the things that you're doing among us as you stretch our faith so that we grow and as we welcome new people aboard. It's a real blessing. And we thank you and praise you for it. We pray that you find us faithful, that you continue to lead us and guide us by your word and by your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you make us responsive. Help us to be prepared in season and out of season to give the reason for the hope that we have. Not so that we look good, but for your glory, for your praise, for your honor, and for your kingdom to come in all of its fullness. Hear our prayer, for we come in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing the old rugged cross. This is a favorite song that uh, the Giros asked us to include in our worship service.
may be seated. We will come to the Lord's Supper table with a prayer first of uh, penitence. It's a response of prayer, and so the responses will be on the screen. Um, you're allowed to keep your eyes open when we pray this time. Let's talk to God. Holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have not listened to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess to you, O God, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O God. Our self-indulgent ways and our exploitation of other people. Our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate to us. We confess to you, O God. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O God. Our negligence in prayer and in worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O God. For all false judgments and uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbors. For our, all our prejudice, all our contempt towards those who are different from us. Accept our oh God. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept our repentance, O oh God. Restore us, O oh God, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us, O oh God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us and all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. Amen. Hear the gracious words of our Savior Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Again, responsive reading. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the entire universe. In your wisdom you made all things and you sustain them by your power. When we rebelled against you, you did not reject us. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, out of your great, great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us, to heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you by joining our voices with those who forever sing to the glory of your name. No. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ has come again. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. According to his commandment, we remember his death and we proclaim his resurrection. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. 
This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant in my... Uh, this is the blood of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. People loved by God, these are God's gifts for you. Do this in remembrance of him. And here's how we're going to um, be able to serve you the Lord's Supper elements. Starting on this side, we're going to walk around the sanctuary and come past this way. That chair, I'll probably have to move. And uh, one station will be here to, uh, to serve you the bread. The other station will be here to serve you the cup. And then you can return to your seats. And then when we're all together, everybody has been served, then we'll participate all together, taking the bread first and then taking the cup. And come forward, even if you're not going to participate, and the people at the front will have something to say to you. Usually we say something like, this is Christ's body or Christ's blood given for you. Appropriate response is amen or thank you or glory be to God. It's something appropriate to uh, acknowledge the, uh, the gift that God has given to you. Ask the elder to come forward. And starting on this side, come around the sanctuary. You're going to give directions, Harry? Thank you. Yeah. You were expecting that, weren't you? Yeah. No. No. Where's body given for you? Christ was 
that to you, Chad. The body of Christ given for you, Mark. John, Christ was crucified for you. Alec, Christ was crucified for you. The body of Christ given for you, Wilma. Christ was crucified for you. The body of Christ given for you. Christ was crucified for you, Mickey. Nicole, Christ was crucified for you. The body of Christ given for you. Christ was crucified for you. Christ was crucified for you. The body of Christ given for you. Is there anybody else I can serve in your seats? Dearly loved people of God, take, eat, remember, and believe that Christ's body was given for the complete forgiveness of all your sin. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of your sin. Stand and sing in response, God who created hearts to love. <clears throat> Please rise if you're able. After you receive God's blessing, give a moment for those who just profess their faith time to come to the front, and then the same way we went for communion, feel free to come forward and offer your encouragement and congratulations to them. But first, people loved by God, lift up your hearts to receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. And together we say, Amen. God ever joyful singing be, sign of our faithful unity. Alleluia, alleluia. Baptized in water, we are fed.